The next one up it has also been an inspiration to many Norwegian and other entrepreneurs. Uh, it's Jørn Lys again uh, from Meltwater. Okay, so my name is uh, Jørn Lys again. Uh, I grew up on a farm in Trysil. I never aspired to become an entrepreneur, and in many ways I uh, become an accidental entrepreneur. As a matter of fact, I really didn't, I'm one of these uh, kids that never had any plan. I never really knew what I wanted to do. I always admired those people that, you know, at the eight, eight, 18, I'm gonna do this and that. At the age of 30, I'm going to, yeah, all these things, right? Um, I actually started out as, as a um, uh, research scientist at the Norwegian Computing Center, and I was very, very fulfilled. I just loved to immerse myself in a topic and feel that I really mastered it. And the last thing on my mind was that I was going to do anything to do with internet, uh, anything to do with business. But then I just simply fell in love with internet. I downloaded uh, Netscape 2.0, the specification for Netscape 2.0. And that was a point where internet transformed for me from a collection of text files, ASCII text files that you download and, and render in a pretty way with your browser, to a parallel computing system at a scale that world had never seen before. Because with Netscape 2.0, you can download an applet that was executed in a browser. And I was so per perplexed by this, and I was so astonished, my, my mind was running wild, and I was convinced that this was as important an event as the invention of electricity, the invention of writing, and I just felt just incredibly privileged to be living right at this time. And that's how I quit my job and actually become an entrepreneur. I really didn't have an idea uh, or a business idea at all. I just wanted to be a part of it. I just wanted to be a part of this thing called the internet because there was no question in my mind that this was going to be really big. Today I'm going to talk about Meltwater. I'm going to give a little bit of background about Meltwater. And I've been asked to talk about uh, how we expanded from a small country like Norway internationally. And I'll, at the end I will try to finish off with some reflections and some maybe could be experiences that others can benefit from as well. So, this is how it started, a very humble start. Uh, not so far away from here, uh, uh, Shack 15, Skud 15, uh, for Tjuvholmen. Uh, Tjuvholmen was at the time a little bit less glamorous place uh, as it is now. It was pretty run down and nobody wanted to be there because everyone knew that it was going to be demolished. Uh, but because of that, we got free office space. And as a startup, that's phenomenal, right? You want to cut uh, all the costs you can. And not only that, we got 26 obsolete computers from uh, Netavisen that they didn't use anymore. And we were carefully picking out the pieces from the different computers that worked. And that's how we assembled our first um, uh, server park. So this was the start. And I, you know, we had all sorts of troubles initially. I, I'm not gonna go into that because I only have seven minutes and I have four minutes left. But uh, we, we decided to go global. Um, what we do is that we mine online news and social media. So we help companies across the world um, understand their clients better, understand the competition better, and understand a general ecosystem. Coca-Cola, for example, which is a client of us in seven countries, they used our system in the past to understand how their brand was associated with youth obesity, which was a big issue in the US uh, a few years back, uh, because at the time they had lots of vending machines in high schools and schoolyards, and were really beaten up because of that. Uh, today, we have 20,000 clients, we have 900 employees, we, are nine, we, are, we have clients in 90 countries, and we have 50 offices across the world. And we are today the global leader in media intelligence. Oops. One piece, okay. Um, all right, uh, so some reflections of what happened. So when we started out, we knew in our heart we wanted to be global because if we didn't, you know, it wouldn't be worthwhile all the hard work. And one of the first things we internalized was that Norway is a very small country. 
I used to say that there are bus stops out, uh, outside of New York with a larger economy than what we have in Norway. <laughs> so if you want to create a significant company, you need to go abroad. And I think a lot of the challenges or a lot of the problems with Norwegian companies is that they're only Norwegian or primarily Norwegian. Most of the business is from Norway. And that, of course, significantly limits the size of the business itself. The thing that we focused on from a very early stage was culture. Because if you want to be a global player, we wanted to be the best in the world, that needs to be ingrained in the culture. And one of the things that I come to appreciate over the years is that of all the factors that goes into building a company, by far the most important factor is culture. Because culture sets aspiration level. Do we want to be the best in Norway? Do we want to be the best in Europe? Or do we want to be the very best in the world? Huge differences, huge ramifications for where you want to be. Another thing is it aligns people's decisions, it aligns people's uh, efforts. So it is an incredibly important factor in building a company. The second factor I would uh, focus on is talent. I think uh, Nicholas from uh, Klarna also talked about that. And we have been obsessed about talents in Meltwater. So for the first five years of the development, of the five, five first years of the company's history, most of my time I actually spent interviewing. So my life was really mostly a, an endless travel from one recruitment room to another. And some of the people in my management team, they made a back of the envelope calculation and they concluded that I actually met 3,000 people face to face in interviews over the five first years. And I'm really, really happy that I did that because that I, that I made that investment at the time was really important because those people were going to be the backbone. They're going to be the executives and key people, the key culture ambassador in the company going forward. Another thing that we also understood very early on was the importance of sales. And I think in Norway, that is not something that is uh, looked upon with the same respect, with the same importance, and it maybe should. Innovation sounds good. Expansion sounds good. Market share sounds good. But sales, that's, that is not doesn't have the same prestige or glamour. And I believe that all good software companies primarily focus on sales. Because if you are a software company, you have invested in a product which later can be distributed for free many, many times. So the whole idea with a software company is to sell what you, pro what you produce as many times as possible. So I have a rule of thumb when you look at good software companies, you just count the number of salespeople over the total number, of sale, uh, total number of employees. If 80 to 90% of the people in the organization is sales or sales related, then it's a good uh, software company. Um, another thing I would also say is related to conviction. Because when you build a company, you're always faced with uncertainty. They're always so hard to really know what you should do. But I think the most dangerous thing you can do is to hesitate. And that sometimes you need to make really, really bold decisions. And one of the key decisions we made in Meltwater was simply go, to go to the US. And in many ways, you can think of Meltwater, which is basically a search engine. You know, to export a search engine technology to the US seems a little bit counterintuitive. But of course, if you want to be the best in the world, the US market, the mother of all market, is really, really important. So for that reason, there were four of us in the company that made a pact. We sold everything we owned. We sold house, we sold car, we sold a boat, we sold everything. And what we have left, we packed in two suitcases, jumped on the plane, and landed in San Francisco. And we did that more like as a mental commitment, that if we go, we have to succeed. And I decided to go as well because the US is so important. So it was a very critical decision for us. And it was more critical than it appears on the surface because those four people, including myself, 
was essentially the man management team of the company. So think about that. What happens to a company if the management team is put on a plane and you fly them to the other side of the world? Well, in our case, the company did better than ever, <laughs> surprisingly. <laughs> so get rid of the management and the company does well, right? Yep. And I think that is one of the things that uh, I'm really proud of. And I think that was part of the investment in the five first years. There's so much strong talent pushing up uh, to fill new positions. And the last thing I will say is that, you know, entrepreneurship, you know, in many ways, at least in this kind of setting, sounds glamorous. It's something that is very um, attractive. But you also should know that it's very tough. This is not for everyone. It is really, really challenging. And I think one of the things that, you know, you should do in order to be successful is all to relax a little. I think one of my strengths is I'm really good at relaxing. <laughs> I'm really good at relaxing when I'm not working, but I'm not working. Weekends, you know, if I chill, then I chill. And uh, I'll leave you to that. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. <laughs> so, so, so the take is relax and go all in.